about Ezra Pound fans under the overpass. I have stumbled across something today. It was a very brief essay I read. And I wasn't going to do it on air, but I remembered we had a conversation. I think we might even did an episode about it. I'm going to say this as politely as I can because I don't remember exactly what the episode title was, but I don't think it was nice. About um, Bill Maher when he was – because he had a couple rants that we didn't agree with, one against uh. people who enjoy comic books. But his the main one was about escapism. And how he pretty much had a strong disdain for escapism and people who imbibed in escapism. Well, an essay I read today, and again, this might not be the, I don't think this is a complete thing, but this was by J.R.R. Tolkien, okay. uh, his thoughts on escapism and why it's a good thing. And I felt that this sums up our feelings way better than we can ever articulate. That makes sense. Because we're kind of the dumb. So I that makes, yeah, that can make sense that somebody that far like that, yeah. you know. Oh, Professor Tolkien knew what he was talking yeah. about. And he says he kind of, he didn't invent escapism by any means, but he sure made some of the most escapable forms of escapism. Fantasy is probably one of the most easier things to escape into yeah. because it's so different and out there to... I mean, you can escape into, like, a hard crime, like, a hard, you know, pulp novel, but, like, it might not even be fun, <laughs> You know right, what I mean? yeah. Uh, this is from Escape In On Fairy Stories by J.R.R. Tolkien. I assume if you look that up, that's where you'll get, uh, you know, it'll pop up. I actually found it on an article article because I was reading a quote he had about escapism that's wrongly attributed to him. And the quote actually was uh, Ursula, I forget her name, we just covered her in the fantasy episode, I think we did. But she paraphrased this uh, essay and uh, for some reason somebody attributed the quote to Tolkien. But this is what he actually had to say, which is still very similar to what she said, just way more eloquent. I have claimed that escape is one of the main functions of fairy stories, and since I do not disapprove of them, it is plain that I do not accept the tone of scorn or pity with which escape is now so often used, a tone for which the uses of the word outside literary criticism give no warrant at all. In what the misusers are fond of calling real life, escape is evidently, as a rule, very practical and may even be heroic. In real life, it is difficult to blame it unless it fails. In criticism, it would seem to be the worse, the better it succeeds. Evidently, we are faced by a misuse of words and also by a confusion of thought. Why should a man be scorned if, finding himself in prison, he tries to get out and go home? Or if when he cannot do so, he thinks and talks about other topics than jailers and prison walls? The world outside has not become less real because the prisoner cannot see it. And using escape in this way, the critics have chosen the wrong word. And what is more, they are confusing, not always by sincere error, the escape of the prisoner with the flight of the deserter. Just so a party spokesman might have labeled departure from the misery of the Fuhrer or any other right and even criticism of it as treachery. In the same way, these critics, to make confusion worse, and so to bring into contempt their opponents, stick their label of scorn not only onto desertion, but onto real escape, and what are often its companions, disgust, anger, condemnation, and revolt. Not only do they confound the escape of the prisoner with the flight of the deserter, but they would seem to prefer the acquiescence of the quizzling to the resistance of the patriot. To such thinking you have only to say, the land you loved is doomed to excuse any treachery, indeed to glorify it. Take that, Bear Maher. I want to just send that to Bill Maher, because... That so perfectly sums it up, and if no other part than the prisoner analogy, where if you're in jail, why should you only be allowed to talk about jail and be involved in jail? Uh, why not be able to escape that world? That doesn't mean you're fleeing that world. Yeah. That doesn't mean you're a coward or showing any kind of cowardice because you don't want to face that world. It just means you need a goddamn break. That's the way I look at it. Like, I mean, Why is escapism bad? That's probably partially the reason, like, why whenever I'm on, on my breaks and lunch at work, I'm normally reading something. And also, why is literary fiction not considered escapism? Just because you're reading about real things or things that could really happen. So if you're reading... I would probably say because of the dry, dare boringness of it all. <laughs> of, of the makes you more... You just have to be miserable? Yeah, like, you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of hard to escape... Like I said, like maybe like you know, like I could see like um, like like Huckleberry Finn and like you, you know, um, stuff from him. Like you know, those are more kind of adventurous. You know, I could see getting lost in that. But like 
getting lost in like for whom the bell tolls or, or whatever fucking even ever. the great Gatsby yeah like fucking Le Miserable like you know what I mean how are you gonna escape into that like I don't wanna be in there I don't no wanna, yeah. I don't wanna go there I mean I like reading that stuff but I don't read that to escape and I don't escape because I hate life or I can't face my problems because Bill Maher his whole thing was about mainly Marvel movies and comics and grown up children people who refuse well, to he, grow up that's whenever he like he swing at Kevin Smith real hard like, yeah I just like fuck you guy like, first of all you're making fun of Kevin Smith yeah. good job he does that enough on his own you're not gonna like but if you want to get lost in a world of hobbits and just enjoy your time like why is that bad and how is that different than watching movies or TV? And you think he wouldn't have that big of a deal or, like, you know, a problem with that with all, like, because, like, he's a big weed smoker. Bill Maher? Yeah. Like, he's a huge weed head, like, so I don't know why escaping, you know, like, you know, well, why you what the have... fuck is his show? Like, he came from, like, stand-up comedy, right? So, how is stand-up comedy not escapism? Because they might talk about real-world matters and make fun of them? Like, that, I, if I go to a stand-up... Uh, comedy show, like, we go to the... If we go to the improv or yeah. something and we go to see a show, how is that really any different than us reading a book or watching a movie? No. It's all the same shit. I'm just doing it to get my mind off of things yeah. and enjoy something. Uh, that doesn't mean... Like, what lame ass is just sitting there on a chair just looking at the wall going, I'm going to think about all my problems and that's all I'm going to do. Like, nobody does that. I don't, I don't see... Like, I okay, I understand how it could be harmful if... All you do in life, yeah. like you're living in somebody's fucking basement, and all you do is watch Marvel movies, and you don't strive for anything better in life, don't have a job, don't do anything but do that, you could still do that same thing without being into the Marvel movie. Yeah. You could just be a bum, like, uh, you could be into drugs, and they get, that's not, because I don't remember if he had a thing about drugs being comparable, like drug users to escapism, because you're using drugs to escape. But not everybody uses drugs to escape either. It's just like, he I don't like those generalities. Like, he generalizes well, everybody in such a stupid way. Well, as we said, because as we mentioned, I'm pretty sure we mentioned back on that episode, I doubt that's even what he actually thinks or believes. Just to get views. Yeah, he was just trying to get views, because, like, that was true. He said that a couple times now, and it's stupid every time he says it. Because I know the, the one time that, that we were talking about, it was, like, shortly after um, Trump got elected president, and he was trying to blame all those kind of people and yeah. why you know uh, only in America and too like he's like only in America do you find these adults reading you know not con- true at all not true at all you go over to Japan and like everybody's reading manga um um reading manga over there you know what I mean it's just and the more oppressive the government the more people want to escape too because look at China like where does Marvel and stuff do most of their money overseas usually in yeah. China because well this is just a lot of people they got a lot of people who want to escape for a little bit. As I get older, I, one, I'm able to spot these people out way easier than I ever was when I was a young man, because when you're a young man, you're foolish, and you believe, you know, you, you oh, I kind of believe what this guy's saying, and then you just fall into uh, their way of thinking, but when you get older, you start realizing, like, oh, this is a provocateur, there's just mm. so many of these, these fucking Bill Mars, Candace Owen, you know, it doesn't matter what side of the coin these people fall on, they're not doing it because that's necessarily their beliefs, they're doing it because they want reactions of money. Yeah. Uh, what gets reactions? Saying outlandish shit. What gets some money? People paying attention. Yeah. That's all it is. Uh, it's been going on for years, but it's like really bad now. Oh, it, yeah. It's got way worse than the past, you know, the past few years. Uh, like the biggest example, and I don't want to get too political on this show, but like that Tommy Lauren girl, I remember she got fired from, I don't remember if she was on Fox News, Newsmax. I think she was like on Fox News. Whatever she was on. Because, like, she was, like, the, what do they call her? Like, the right-wing Barbie or something. It's all of this yelling at the camera about black people and how they're bad. And she just, like, says all this outlandish shit to get people mad and fired up. But then, it like, she went on a show, like, The View or something, and was talking about, like, she's, like, pro-choice. Like, she doesn't, you know, she's not, she's against, like, restrictive abortion laws. And they fired her. <laughs> Man. She, like, said one real thing, like, one actual opinion that's hers, and she got fired for it. So what did she do? She went and even doubled down harder on the, the crazy shit. She got hired by somebody else, I think. But it's just, like, whenever you see these people saying this crazy shit, just think, do they actually believe this? Or is this just what gets the money? I mean, and it's also hard, too, because, like, if somebody's like, hey, Spencer, if you, like, act super woke online and say all this crazy shit, we're going to give you millions of dollars in sponsorship deals and stuff. What are you going to do? It's like, oh, I don't have to work anymore? Yeah. I just have to say really crazy shit? And then that goes to a morality issue. It's like, you know, 
where's your moral compass? Are you really willing to sell your soul, so to speak, to uh, get money? Uh, but a lot of people are. And usually it's people that weren't hard up to begin with. That's yeah. what I think is funny. Most of these people, like the Candace Owens and the Tommy Lowers and stuff, they were, like, good. <laughs> like, well, they were, like, well, they, they had, had an uh, okay life before. Well, because it, well, you had that okay life, so you have a taste. You're like, what I more? know what the next level is. Yeah. To where, like, you know, people like us, like, we know, like, we're nowhere near that. Yeah. So, like, there's no, you know what I mean? There's no connection. It's, it's, it, honestly, like, those people I get, but it's like the people like Bill Maher who disappoint me. And I don't know much, because I never was into Bill Maher. I didn't like his stand-up and stuff. But I assume he went the same route most guys in his time did. He went through the stand-up, you know, I'm poor. I'm living in hotels and motels and shit. You know, that kind of life on yeah. the road. So, the fact that he gets to be, like, an elite now, and then he just, like, sells himself. It's like... Really, guy? Like, I'm not... Like, that's shitty. Now, there are, like... I'm trying to think of... I don't know. I just... I, I don't like the provocateur bullshit. Like, I don't... I don't think that you should, uh... Especially... Do things for... That's... That's why I appreciate a guy like Norm McDonald so much because yeah. he didn't give a shit. No. He had so many shows that he would just purposely let tank because he just well, didn't give a fuck. And, like, he's like, I'm not selling myself to any company or anything. I'm just going to do what I like to do. If it's funny, you, it's funny. If people don't think it's funny, then I don't care. And you, if you, and with Norm McDonald, you knew like if he said something kind of out there a little bit, you know he's just saying it. Just to fuck with you. Yeah, just to try to get a rise out of you. What we'll, we'll like, we were saying with the other people... Chances are they that's not even something that they think. Yeah. They're just either getting paid to say it or they want the attention. You, you well, know? like Kathy Griffin with the whole holding up the fake Trump head. Was that like a legit, like, does she really think that, oh, Trump should be, I'm sure she doesn't like Trump, but it's like, are her feelings that strong that she's willing to lose her whole career over that? Or is she going, if I do this, there's like a 50% chance. chance. I might I'm get gonna, my crew back. Yeah, like, I'm going to be, you know, get a show out of this or something. Like, I think that's what most of these people think. And uh, you see that on Twitter all the time with, like, the woke mob and then the right-wing mob always fighting. And, like, people see the most outlandish shit on there. And it's like, you don't even fucking believe that, do you? Like, I'm not going to go into it, but obviously there's been a trial recently. And I've seen so many people say, did you even watch it? Did you even watch it? And I'm just thinking, when do you have time to watch, like, a whole fucking murder trial? Mm -hmm. Like, why do you care so much? Like, you don't know anybody involved personally. Like, it's just weird to me. That people get so invested in these things that, like, like the OJ trial back in the day, it's like everybody was so invested in that, and it was like all over the news for like. Still, people talk about it. I was like, well, why, why do you care so much? Well, at least that one I could see because of the time period that it happened. It was like the first big one. Yeah, that was what, like that. but now with technology, you just now every day there's ten of those things. So yeah, so it's like it's just all about like here's my opinion. Listen to me. I think uh, Anthony Jesselnik had a joke about that. It was like somebody, it was like something awful too, like a fucking, some big, like 9-11, like some big tragedy. Well, he's also, and he he's like, one of those kind of guys provocateur, who just, who's just but, trying to say some shit. To, but it's, that's his gimmick. It's yeah. Not, he, like it's, he's out there that he says that stuff to make you mad. Like that's not like he's just doing it for money, which he does get for that. But he, like one of his things was uh, anytime there's like a national tragedy, it's always like somebody's got to say some shit, even though if they don't have something to say, just because it's look at me, how do I feel about this? Don't you want to know how I feel about this? <laughs> it's like no, we don't. Mm -hmm. Like why are you asking Jaw Rule about nine eleven? Like, no, we don't <laughs> talk about Jaw Rule. But that, that's the weird celebrity culture we live in. But you know, just going back to the basic here, the escapism. Because we went really far off track. Yeah, we did. Uh, that's fine. Uh, I don't know if this will be a DBS episode or not, but I I really like that uh, what Tolkien had to say about escapism because if anybody has room to talk, it's the guy who invented so much lore. And I just don't think that uh, there's anything wrong with it. As long as you're not overdoing it, obviously. You're not ignoring your whole life for it. But I don't see that as any kind of act of cowardice because you're not facing your life. Especially like uh, we, um, you know, as we stated him writing that, you know, decades ago to, like, now, like, the things that you need, like, the escape escapism from, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Your 40-plus hours a, a week shitty job that you can't stand going to, but you have to go to because, you know, you either got a mortgage or you got a, you know, you got a kid at home, and, you know, but you know what? If, if reading a graphic novel... At the end, you know, right before you go to bed, you know, each night. If it makes you happy, what's yeah, wrong with it? Yeah, if that helps you recharge or, you know, helps you get through the day, like, you know what I mean? Because, again, like, what's that, like, music? Yeah. Music is a, is a form Escape. of esca escapism, like, so, I don't, I don't know, like, there's a lot of 
people giving a shit about somebody else's shit where they shouldn't be giving a shit about it. And you know why? That's the negative form of escapism was like the gossip blogs and shit like that. People who use other people's problems as a means of escape. People who are in other people's business because they don't want to face their own problems. Yeah. Like that's the negative kind of escapism. It's like, oh, did you hear about Brenda next door? Yeah, I heard she's not, you know, she broke up with her boyfriend, but she's still pregnant and like they don't know what to do. And it's like, why do you care what Brenda's doing? Like, yeah. what what about your your fucking roof's caving in? Maybe you yeah. pay for that. Like, people don't want to face their own problems, so they focus on other people and talk about other people, which that, is also a bigger issue with like the celebrity culture and stuff. That are just like, you know, like in that scenario, the person saying that she has she has three different kids of three different people, and it's like, well, maybe Maybe not, you know, yeah. worry about your own shit before you, you know, start criticize just, somebody else. Yeah, like, somebody you else. know, just everybody needs to just worry about their own selves. That's my life motto. Just mind your own business. Yeah, mind your own business. If somebody needs something, like, you know, if you're friends or something, they will need something, they'll let you know. Or you'll be able to tell us. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Focus on yours, Jake. You know what I mean? So we'll end the cold open with nothing wrong with escapism as long as you're minding your own business. Yeah. Fuck. Welcome to the Drunken Pen Writing Podcast. My dream is to have a cafe slash bookshop called the Drunken Pen. Ooh, that would be nice. I've I've been thinking seriously about that, and I looked into what the funds and everything. Like, it's like literally $500,000. Oh, I'm money. sure. Uh, it's ridiculous. And in this area, we couldn't have it anyway, so I'd have to go to Pittsburgh and open up the shop. And would good be, lord! It would be even worse. Yeah, but it's like, wouldn't that be cool? Like... The drunken pen, we'd have a back room where like writers meet, we'd make fancy writing friends and I just I dream of these things that'll never happen. We could have like a shot in a book special. Oh yeah. So many fun things. I don't even smoke cigars, but I have a cigar bar. Right. We also Pennsylvania though, so the liquor laws are so stupid here that it'd probably cost me a million dollars to get a license. Uh so anyway, I am your host, Caleb James, and maybe one day if the moon and the lottery numbers are right and uh <laughs> things just line up properly i could also be caleb james the drunken pen bookstore slash cafe slash cafe owner with me today you'll like this name all right i like them all most of the time you like the last week's one yeah. spencer the vancouver vegan vanquisher church so just i'm um, taking out vegans taking out vegans you're vanquishing vegans. Sorry to any vegans that might be listening, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> Spencer is not much of a vegetable fan. Uh, me, I like me some vegetables, and I could be vegan if like I had to. Like, I don't have a problem with it. I just uh, don't like the preaching. Yeah, I don't yeah. like anything. I don't like any prophetizing. I, I'm not about it. Like, just don't, don't tell. If you like CrossFit, good. You don't gotta fucking tell me. Like, you don't gotta tell me. Oh, you like deadlift 600 pounds? Well, you know what you really should do? 87 kipping pull ups. Like, really, trust me. I'll know you're doing CrossFit in like a month from now when you can't walk. When I have like some fucking some kind of be the first person to give himself spina bifida. <laughs> yeah. Like, how do you do that? Uh, today's episode. I think, this will be a DVS episode. Fuck it. We have one last week. We'll have another one because Thanksgiving, holidays coming. Uh, also, that kind of slows up our getting to the 100th episode that I'm, you know. We were trying to prepare for. Yeah, because we have to like do a real episode for that. I wanted to talk about, oh, I didn't really tell you the idea. I think you'll like this. You, you like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you'll like this. I wanted to talk about more of like the appreciation of Pulp Fiction, not the yeah. movie. Actual pulp <laughs> fiction. Uh, movie was good. I like the movie. But, like, you know, the old pulp stories. Because I heard something. I don't even remember. Uh, I think I was. Re- I listened to an episode of the Great Books podcast. That might be it. Somebody in the group. Uh, I made a Robert E. Howard post. And yeah. somebody posted something about the Conan stories on. I think it's the Great Books podcast. I think that's what it's called. I didn't subscribe to him because most of the stuff was not obviously about Conan. But that one episode was. And I listened to it, and they brought up a really good point that I never thought of before. Actually, me and Ashley talked about this in the past, but I never really 
form this into an original idea, like something that I pondered at all. When you have to write, like that's what you're making your money on, yeah. as the pulp writers did, because you have like your Hemingways and stuff. They're rich, famous. They're just kind of writing because well, they have I think stories I know to tell. You, yeah, I think yeah. I saw you ta- talking about this in the post. But when you have to write, from like that's your bread and butter, like paycheck to paycheck writer, you need to make your stories as entertaining as possible. Oh, yeah. Like, you have to make a good story. Like, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And you also have to write them quick. Yeah. Like, if you're, like, a Pulitzer Prize winning author and you're famous, you can be, like, fucking Faulkner and have, like, I'm going to write a stream of consciousness story that nobody can really understand. I could write a fucking Finnegan's Wake, like James Joyce. But if you have to have a good story that people are going to be engaged in and read, and that's your livelihood, and that's going to get you more work, that is a different kind of appreciation for writing I think you have to have. And I think that, and I've talked about this in the group, and uh, we've had this discussion before, but I think pulp writers, especially the likes of like Robert E. Howard, who's become a personal favorite of mine, are vastly underrated and always overlooked when it comes to the uh, literary circles because they didn't write literary fiction. Well, And then you also got to look at that time period that they were working because what, early 1900s, right, you know, late 30s, right, 2030? I would say up to 1950. At that time period, too, I don't think lit- like literary works were even that popular. So I just think even if they wanted to, they'd probably have trouble selling them. Well, we, like, we asked the question before, like, why did Robert, I mean, he died young, but why did Robert E. Howard never actually, like, try writing a literary novel? Well, he I think have. He, well, that we know of, yeah. you know, that he was actually trying to publish. I think you just answered that question. Because we know the works that stand the test of time, uh, The Great Gatsby, uh, you know, For Whom the Bell Tolls Us Up. But what they don't tell you is, like, The Great Gatsby was a flop when it came out. Oh, yeah. It was not a good novel. It was just until it got shipped off to troops overseas during World War Two, And they uh, that's when it became, like, popular. Like, oh, okay. And then, like, a lot of books like Catcher in the Rye got taught in schools. Like, that's how they, they get, you just get picked up, and then you're just, like, luck of the draw there. Um, even the ones that were popular, like, Hemingway was actually popular, and his work was popular. But the reading audience of the time, it wasn't like, oh, Harry Potter, 800 kid, 800,000 kids are going to buy this book, the parents are reading the books. Like, it was a select, a niche group of people who were appreciating those kinds of works. It was actually the pulp works that people were reading in out mass. Of ma- yeah, out of magazines, you yeah. know, out of like nickel magazines that, you know, that. You know, At the time, people weren't able to afford, you mm. know, uh, fucking The Sun Also Rises. Like, they, they probably, not everybody could afford that. And when you go into the Depression era, that's why these pulp things took off so much is because they were made on garbage materials, you know, the pulp paper. Yeah. Uh, and they were dirt cheap, and that's why people were able to read them, pass them to their buddies, and they were able to read them, and they just kind of threw them away. They didn't last, but, like, the novels of the time, like, the great novels, like the Thomas Wolfs and stuff, uh, like, a Tom Wolfe novel, it might be super popular, but not a lot of people were actually reading that. No, uh, yeah, especially at the time. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I don't, I said, I think it all just goes back to the time period of when these guys were writing their stuff, because they were in such strict deadlines uh, well, like, let, let's just go, because, you know, we both read Conan. How many of, like, out of those stories in that collection did we have either kind of start the same way, always had the same, like, descriptor? Like, you know, at each yeah. time there was going to be, you know, Jet Some Black. reiteration of yeah, uh, Conan. so, like, at a certain point in time, he has maybe, like, 25% of the story already written, you know, before yeah. even going into the next one. So like it, I don't, I don't know. I do think that, um, like you said, I do agree with you that they don't get the shine they that, should. That they that they probably should. All right, here's the craziest fact: Robert E. Howard died when he was thirty years old. Thirty, and I don't know when he started writing. I didn't go into his biography that hard, but assuming he even started in his teens, but was getting published like most people in the early twenties. Let's just give him give him 12 years. Let's say he published work for 12 years. You see on this desk, there's three Robert E. Howard collections right there. And you got two more. Both, like all of them are more, more than 350 pages, up to 500 pages these are. And that's not the Conan stuff. That's not the Solomon Cain stuff. This is the lesser known stuff. Yeah. How much was this fucking guy writing? I think that's all he did was write and research and do all this shit. And he was like also boxing and doing crazy shit, but... 
It's like he was able to write that much because that's how he made his livelihood there. Because they're probably paying like a fucking penny a story. Like oh they're yeah, dirt cheap. And then we looked at like uh, H.P. Lovecraft, his work. He had such huge volumes of work. Yeah, and you know, very dense literature too. I would consider like the text itself is very dense and hard to read. And yet he 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 didn't he died in, like his forties, early forties. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, because what what. Uh, Lovecraft had cancer to where yeah, like uh, stomach cancer or something. To where um, Howard, I think he killed himself. I think Howard, he? yeah, he killed himself. I think he he like had some mental issues and stuff. Yeah, but just like these guys were able to actually create so much. So I was just kind of thinking, like, what can these guys, these old pulp writers, teach us about writing? One, which I think is the most evident one, is write every yeah. fucking chance you get because that's clearly what they did. And then you can look at guys like Tom Wolf who. You know, his 800,000 page manuscript that had to be cut down, like he wrote all the obsessively too. And he was a literary writer. But like these pulp guys, that was their bread and butter, was just selling to these magazines. So they had to write every day, get as many things published as they could. And a word count, I, you know. Oh, yeah, hit word counts and everything. So, one, you know, write as often as you can. Two, you have to make the story entertaining. So you have to become a pretty damn good storyteller to do that. To make, be able to sell that many stories, you have to be able to tell stories that people, even if they're not the greatest stories, like people want to have to read them beginning to end and want more in the future. Three, which would you'll see with the pulp writers uh, especially, you have to know how to create the drama, where to put the drama, and where the action should be, and how to pace these stories. Yes, they pat pacing's a big factor with pulp. And, you know, crime fiction and all that kind of stuff. And they say Robert E. Howard was pretty much the creator of the sword and sorcery genre, which we talked about last episode, our fantasy episode, about what the difference was between regular fantasy. Sword and sorcery is just mostly action. You don't really describe the magic systems too much. You don't do any world building. It's just all action. That's how these pulp fiction stories were. But I think if you can master that and then incorporate that into longer works that have world building... I think you really would have something. Yeah. Like if you have a fantasy story where you have the sword and sorcery aspects that work the best, but then also have a you know classic fantasy yeah. involved. You know what though? What um noticed too is like even to you know we we're talking about the you know pulp fiction and then stuff like that is that even now I don't think like there's a huge um I don't want to say like fan base, but you know what I mean. Like I don't think there's a lot of people craving like pulp and if they are it's like the old pulp stuff it's not like any kind of like you know new pulp you know kind of things you don't think it's kind of been either reimagined or just taken a different shape because there's like a lot of uh you know online sci-fi blogs and sci-fi stories there's a lot of crime fiction crime fiction is the big one now uh the harlequin romances are still very popular and those are pretty much pulp stories they're just romance uh i think a lot of these have taken shape you know taken in the form of novels, like short novels or novelettes, but they, I would still say, like, the pulp genre is strong, it's just not what we consider to be pulp, because I think of, when I think of pulp, I think of a literary story that's told in a fun way, uh, because you, people won't think of Conan as literary by any means, but when you read that, yeah. and the way it's written, you're like, oh, I could easily see this style being, impo- you know, superimposed upon a World War Two story. And being just as entertaining. And now, you know, when you get to, like, the analogies and, like, some of the themes in those stories, usually they're pretty superficial. But, like, a guy like Robert E. Howard, I think, is he was more than talented enough that he could have actually wrote some real-world story. He could have fucking blown Cormac McCarthy out of the fucking water. <laughs> That's what I say. That's what I fucking say. And you know what? I'll stick by that till the day I die. Robert E. Howard, miles above Cormac McCarthy. I don't huh. care what Cormac McCarthy has won. Well, it also hasn't co- like Cormac McCarthy's only done like like five novels. Like he doesn't have a very big. Uh, I think he's done like ten. No. One like did he win the Pulitzer for the Road? I think he did. Listen, they consider Cormac McCarthy the be- greatest living American author. I do not. Bullshit. I don't like his storytelling style, and I don't like his writing style. And you know what? I think if he read some pulp stories growing up instead of uh, Civil War stories, I think he would uh, he wouldn't be so dry. I don't know. You know what? We'll change gears slightly. Raymond Chandler, another one. I mean, he broke out of the pulp market into, you know, the spy genre that he created. But that's pretty much pulp stories, too. Like the, not the spy genre, the detective genre. Yeah. He did, uh, 
I can't remember his name. The Marlowe, Philip yeah, Marlowe yeah. stories and stuff. Uh, cause we, we read the, the big sleep and those are pretty much pop stories. They're well, just a novel yeah. form and they're a lot of fun, but a lot of people, he, they considered him on the cusp of like a literary guy. Like he's on there, but why? His stories are no different than a co- You could easily see those stories being, you know, short stories inside of a pulp magazine. I think he did write a lot of pulp too, didn't he? Yeah. No, okay. Let's go one step up. Because even like The Big Sleep, that wasn't that big of a, you know no, what I mean? The Big Sleep was the small novel. Yeah. Why don't we take a step up, one step up, go to Ian Fleming? That's where, that's where you're going to go next. Yeah. Now, that's the spy novel I'm thinking of. So James Bond... Yeah, and that's got to be pulp, right? Yeah, that's uh, that's I, not literary by any, that's less literary than Chandler's work, I think. Uh, just the writing style. I mean, we only read one James Bond. We can't really compare any of those guys. We only read one book of each. But just from what I can tell, it seems like Ian Fleming was less literary because he wasn't even a writer until he was older uh, or old. I forget after he was out of his service and stuff. Like we always split the hairs. But when is it? Do you take a pulp guy and allow him to be a literary guy? Because we have this conversation about the Stephen King. Because we think Stephen King, if he was, which obviously by what he liked to read when he was growing up, he would have been a pulp writer oh, yeah. if that was still around. Like, if that was what it was now, if we were in the pulp writing era, well, well, that's what he would be. Well, it's kind of like those um, um, hard case novels are, like the later... Like pulp novels, yeah. Later, uh, Colorado Kid and Joyride, those are kind of... And, and I'm pretty sure probably any, it's, it's a publisher, I guess, but it's uh, hard case files or... Mm. I think that's what it's called, but yeah, they they do a series of like and even like the covers. They got like that night, like uh, you know, very pulpy kind of cover to it. But yeah, you can definitely tell by the way that his writing style yeah, was influenced is, by is influenced by that stuff, which who I think is the greatest living American writer, Stephen King. Yeah, that's a bold statement. Well, fuck you then. Anybody that doesn't agree with me, I'm trying to think. See, it's hard for me to disagree because i don't like cormac mccarthy um obviously steinbeck's dead vonnegut's dead yeah i think norman mailer's dead which i haven't read his work so i can't judge uh jesus that's depressing is john updike dead he might be dead i haven't read his work either and yeah i mean and just the body if you go by body of work obviously james patterson <laughs> or dean coons spencer no but i'm just saying it all I, <laughs> I i feel like it's hard to like and i'm not trying to say somebody who's wrote in 20 20- novels is better than some hero 10 novels but like i think that's also a if factor. you judge by the consistency of quality yeah because people don't like especially literary snobs they do not like to do this but i call this the mark twain uh method is popularity yeah they don't like to judge popularity in regards to literary success or how uh well somebody writes which i, I get that obviously because stephanie meyer come on yeah but mark twain super popular and is also one of the best American writers of all time, if not uh. the best. So Stephen King has that going for him where he's one of the most popular, if not the most well-known American author of all time. Because I know that's a bold statement as well. But if you ask a random person who doesn't read yeah. to name an author, chances are it will be Stephen King. Uh, I guarantee I don't know, these Zoomers are a little different. But still, there's enough movies and stuff. Do you ever get de- depressed whenever it's like uh, Jay Leno or whoever is they Jay- ask, But they edit those videos to ask people in the streets, name an author, name yeah. a book. Um, oh yeah, they take out all the people that do, but there's still a, a alarming a number number of people who can't name a author. You know, there's like some guys like they probably go on a streak, a bad losing streak too. Where it's like, hey sir, can you name an author? Oh yeah, Samuel Beckett, of course. <laughs> what? Oh fuck that guy. Hey hey buddy, can you name an author? Well, uh, hmm, let me see. There's uh, Fitzgerald. You know what? I'm I'm gonna say Gertrude Stein actually. <laughs> oh fuck, this guy said Gertrude Stein. Stein. Dude, that guy's a hobo. Let's ask that bum, the guy that's begging for change under the overpass. Hey, buddy, can you name an offer? Well, I will say the poet Ezra Pound if I must. (laughs) Why do they all talk like that? What the fuck's going on? Let's get out of here. Got a skid row. A lot of Ezra Pound fans under the overpass. That, that's how I need to start every episode with that sound clip right there. A lot of Ezra Pound fans <laughs> under the over because that's like a double entendre almost. Ezra Pound, like, <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm doing? I'm jerking it for 15 cents a popper. Um, so back to the story that we're talking about. Two guys walked in. Oh no, we're talking about a story. Uh, Stephen King. I didn't want to make the episode about Stephen King, but I would say he's like the modern pulp writer who's evolved beyond pulp fiction. Yeah. His stories obviously are more layered than a simple pulp story, but I think Robert E. Howard stories were more layered yeah. than a simple pulp story. 
Uh, I think most of those guys were. Now, obviously, there's countless unnamed pulp authors that like we just don't know about. Now, where do you think uh, Lovecraft fell? I because I always felt like he fell more towards the he came literary about, side. I like, feel like he came about when there was a gap between Poe and the Lost Generation. So they didn't have like who was a literary writer outside of Russia during that period between because when did Poe die like sixty five seventy something like so you had Edgar Allan Poe and you had Mark Twain which again that's like Civil era Civil War era so we're talking let's make the break point exactly nineteen hundred yeah start of the twentieth century who is the defining author of the time like maybe Proust was around then uh. I'm just spitballing because these are a lot of people I've read, like Dostoevsky, Tolstoy. Those are like I don't know what point those guys died off, but in American fiction, I don't know who the defining author of that era would be because I don't, when did Mark Twain die? Uh, let me look oh, that I up know. real quick. But I, even so, I don't think he was making fiction if he was alive then. Um, Samuel Clemens, where, where are you? You know Mark Twain's good when you just type Mark and he comes up pretty hmm. quick. Uh, he died. I figured him and him and then then Marky Mark. I figured that you know those would be the one too. Marky Mark. (laughs) Uh, he died in 1910, so I'd say he was not creating fiction really at the time. So yeah, that was like a gap between Poe to you had like Fitzgerald. Uh, then Hemingway became popular, and then you had the whole Lost Generation develop, and then after that you get into like the Vonnegut's and the Steinbeck's and stuff after you know the 30s and 40s, but. I would say Lovecraft fell in during that period because that's when the pulp started and literary fiction was kind of, I would imagine, stagnant. Because like I said, can you, I can't think of any great novels that might have I mean, I'm sure there are, but American great novels that came out in that decade or even the till 1920, not too many. So I would say Lovecraft just kind of fell. Like, he came about at the wrong time. So uh, I know like he kind of was in like the pulp magazines. Well, and that's stuff. all he wrote for was pulp magazines. But he tried to emulate Edgar Allan Poe because yeah. that's who his inspiration was. And Edgar Allan Poe just came about at a time where it was like serialized fiction and stuff. He didn't do novels. He had one novel and it was a failure. But other than that, like he, there wasn't like two, you know, I think Moby Dick was a failure too at the time. Like, and Herman Melville, I think also like Dick, they all did like serialized fiction. You know, it wasn't like just, oh, let's make a novel. So H.P. Lovecraft was still kind of riding that trend. But then all these novelists came out, and he was like, I need to make money, uh, but my stories that I want to tell, nobody's fucking reading those, so it's going to be weird and eerie and all those kind of pulp magazines. So he's just, yeah, I think he just came out at the wrong time, because he was what I would consider literary fiction in a pulp setting, because of his writing style. Uh, maybe not necessarily a storytelling style, but if you read his stuff, obviously it's, it's more layered and dense than what you would say... Uh, you know, like a modern, like James Patterson story would be, right? Like any kind of. I have shits that more layered than his, <laughs> than his stories. You never read James Patterson. You can't judge. <laughs> You're just doing it because it's trendy, Spencer. We're gonna stop this. No. We judged Stephanie Meyer. We never read No Twilight, <laughs> but I did read excerpts, and they were terrible. No, well, I, I listened to many episodes of air read this when they did Paris and Bingo and those chapters were terrible. They were very bad. Uh, very bad. You know another episode I'd like to do on the podcast because uh, Ash just actually publishes tomorrow but since this doesn't come out till next week it's last Wednesday for you listeners. Uh, Ash just did a drunken book review of Paperbacks from Hell which is a non-fiction book that talks about which is essentially the pulp books of the 70s, all the horror novels yeah. that came out in the 70s. And I kind of think this is weird because when Stephen King hit it big, at the time there was like all these just crazy overabundance of like corny knockoff like horror novels, just anything you could think of. Because uh, they, they all had those great covers. Yeah. Like that's what you mainly think of back then is those uh, original covers. But I just think it's so funny. It's like Stephen King somehow rose above all those instantly and I mean, granted, he he grinded for years and years. Yeah. And years. But once he became popular, like we saw, once he became known, once he had a book come out, it was like you know it was, it was a big takeoff. So it was like it makes me think because I never I can't say I read any novels from the seventies like those old pulpy horror novels. So I'm just thinking like how much better is his writing than those? <laughs> like how bad were those? Are they not to shit on anybody who listens who's an indie author? But was like those guys essentially the indie authors of 
back that, then. That air, uh, era. Me- meaning they just can get anything published. So even if the quality's not there, the editing's not there, they can just get the work published because the company's like, hey, we're just trying to get shit out as quick as possible. Yeah. Um, trying to move units. Yeah, it's like that movie, uh, what was it, uh, Trumbo, about the Trumbo, he's, uh, he's like a screenwriter and stuff, and he ended up getting... You should watch that movie. It's fucking great. Brian Cranston plays Trumbo, and uh, I like Brian Cranston. Cran- yeah, and then John Goodman is this fucking sleazy movie maker. It's like for like the D-list movies they were making at the time, like just the straight like dog shit movies. And he had Trumbo and these tre- t- uh, they're communist, American communist at the time, and they couldn't get they got blackballed from Hollywood, so they all started writing an, under pseudonyms. All these shit fucking movies, but they were just like so great. Even though the movies like themselves were shit, the screenplays were so great because these are like actual award winning award winning screenwriters who were doing this. These shit movies, but it's, it's a really funny movie. But like that guy also had the pulp style of writing, where just like nonstop everyday writing. Uh, which is what we need to get to. Because I feel like if we were around in the pulp era and we were pulp writers, we'd starve to death immediately. Oh, absolutely. If, if if we're judged by how much work you put out, like that's how you make your living, like the amount of work, we're dead. Oh, yeah. We would never be able to meet deadlines. No. We can't even meet our own deadlines. No. Yeah, I guess I'm going to probably should end this. So we'll end it on that. Uh, according to Spencer Church, Stephen King, best American author. Do you say ever or you just say living? Like right now. Right now. Right now. I mean, I would, he would be in my top three all time, per just personally, but of like right now, give me, give me somebody. George Carroll Oates. I don't even know who the fuck that is. George R. R. Martin. Fuck that guy, no. When was the last time he wrote something? Like a decade and a half ago. <laughs> um, shit. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, we're gonna, I, I do this every single episode, I say, oh, we're gonna end it, and then we don't. Living American... I can't just let you ride out into the sunset with your Stephen King glory. Like, I gotta <laughs> at least have something to counter that. Um, Tony Morrison just died, so fuck. I don't know why it has... Solomon Rushdie is not American. Yeah, it doesn't it's sound... Indian very- and British. I'm sure Pitchin's dead. Colson Whitehead's still alive. I haven't read his work yet. Um, fuck. Brett Easton Ellis? He's obviously not Stephen King level. I don't, I don't even know who that is. See, my mind's gonna be a lot different than... So you're... You're a little bit more Brett well, Ellis. you well read than I am, you know. Oh, oh but Brett, Ellis, uh, Brett Ellis did American Psycho. Mm. I just I thought you you're a big American Psycho fan, aren't you? This is fucking dog shit. Why is this? It's just picked up any. Here we go. You know who's gonna be the the next best American author? Me, Caleb James, and then maybe the vegan van- vanquisher. Yeah, from Vancouver. Yes. Okay, I found a list. Okay, it's the only ten. We'll just read the names. The top. 10 best living American novelist. Number one, Alice Walker. Never heard of her. Number two, Marilyn Robinson. Never heard of her. Number three, Jonathan Franzen. Never heard of him. Number four, Michael Chabon. Never, what did he do? Ventures? Nope, never heard of him. Five, Brett Ellis. Uh, Number six, George Saunders. Number seven, Rachel Kushner. Kushner. Eight, Ann Tyler. Number nine, Stephen King. And number 10, Percival Everett. No James Patterson. No Dean Koontz. No Chuck Palahniuk. So, there's that. Um, anyway. You know who could have probably been on there? Um, and I don't know if he does as much stuff anymore, but uh, Grissom? Like, the guy yeah. who, who did, like, yeah. Uh, and that's the guy who I, I wouldn't mind. Is he American? Because I almost uh. said Neil Gaiman. I was like, clearly he's not. No, yeah. Um, it was getting harder and harder to distinguish British people from American people other than the accent anymore because of the... Uh, the obesity epidemic, the oh, they getting it over politics. There now too? Yeah, they've been getting real fat. Um, no offense, British people, because for some reason every friend we have who's British is actually skinny. But just in general, I've seen on news because I'm a big fan of BBC. I also like the British Broadcasting Channel. <laughs> <laughs> See what I did there? Um, <laughs> whoo, whoa. Uh, if you want to tell us who you think is the best American living author. Uh, as long as it's not Cormac McCarthy, which honestly I could see if you're going literary authors, none of them are left alive, really. So I can see that he wins by default, right? Because <laughs> Tony, I would have said Tony Morrison. But Last man standing. He passed away in 2019. So yeah, he got fucking 100 year old Cormac McCarthy. Not Daniel Lewski, that fucking guy. He sucks. So anyway, if you want to reach out to us, you can at, uh, we have a contact page on Drunken Pen Writing. You could also read our fiction that probably not even good enough to be in pulp fiction at least what we have i think one of my a couple of my stories maybe 
Uh, you can also... What are we doing? Twitter, at Drunk Pen Writing. Facebook and Instagram, at Drunken Pen Writing. And uh, I'm surprised we haven't got shit yet. Well, I guess I literally just dropped today, that fantasy episode. Yeah. I was waiting for some, some hating. because We didn't come up with the list that we read off of there. Because it's 50 best fantasy I could characters. even name you 50 fantasy characters, probably. I think if you really thought of like, if you, they start popping up on TV or something like well, that. Well, yeah. But, well, oh, yeah. yeah. It depends on what, you know. If somebody just said a movie or something that was a fantasy, you'd be like, oh, yeah, this character, this character. Yeah. Like, it's just one of those things you don't think of. But if you're a fantasy genre fan, you'd obviously be offended by how stupid some of those... I, like I said, solid list, just the best. The best! I wouldn't say the best. Um, anyway, thank you for listening, and be sure to check us out, and uh, even though it's going to be late, I hope you have a uh, happy Thanksgiving, if that's what you celebrate. Go, go! I like eating, but I don't really like the message of Thanksgiving, which is togetherness. Fuck that noise. Right. I like divisiveness. <laughs> I'm a provocateur. <laughs> nah! <laughs> Niles! Columbus was right! Whoa. Whoa, no. Columbus was a jerk. Whoa, the, the, the provocateur. Columbus wasn't a provocateur. Just... No, but you're saying things to get people riled up. Oh, so you yeah. just... Hey, hey, yeah. Columbus. Yeah. I did see they just took Thomas Jefferson ta- uh, statue down in New York City Hall that's been standing for almost 200 years. Do what you will with that, Twitter universe.